Good afternoon. I'm William Harris, Acting Director of the FDR Presidential Library and Museum. And I'm so pleased today to be able to welcome Greg Robinson uh, to uh, um, participate in this program for the Day of Remembrance, which commemorates the unjust um, incarceration of Japanese and Japanese Americans during World War II. And uh, I can't go on without uh, also acknowledging the generous support for this program from Patty Hirahara. She has been um, steadfast in, in her support and belief that the FDR library should um, engage in a critical um, analysis and conversation about uh, Japanese um, incarceration. Uh, Greg is, is one of the preeminent um, scholars in, in the study of Japanese uh, incarceration. And he also uh, played a role with our uh, photographic exhibit uh, several years ago um, on this topic. Um, so it's we're really pleased to have him today. He is a professor of history at the University of Qu Quebec at Montreal, and uh, as well as a host of um, academic appointments there. And, um, and he has written extensively on this and other topics. Uh, welcome, Greg. Let's just dive right in with, with how you got to this topic in the first place and then um, we'll we'll go from there. Okay, thank you for inviting me. It's nice to be here. Nice to talk with you, Bill. Uh, actually, the FDR Library plays a central role in how I got to this topic, because many years ago, uh, over almost twenty-five years ago, I was rehearsing researching something else at the FDR Library, and I was waiting for boxes to be brought to me, which is something that you often do when you're at an archive. Although the FDR Library is fairly fast. Where that's concerned, uh, glory to them. But while I was waiting, I was sort of puttering around because I'm a rather restless person. And I discovered finding aids for writings by Franklin Roosevelt, uh, particularly from before he was president, the writings that he had done. And I thought, wow, I never thought of him as much of a writer, not like Churchill or de Gaulle or even Stalin or the others. And so I thought, how did what he write influence or anticipate his later policies? So just then my boxes came and I dropped the dropped the subject, but it remained in the back of my mind. And then some months later, uh, when I had quit school, I was asked to write an article about Franklin Roosevelt for a journal. And I thought, well, what can I write that's new about Franklin Roosevelt? Nobody seemed to have written about his writings. So why don't I look at his writings from before he was president and how they anticipated the New Deal programs? So I ordered up a whole mess of his articles from the 1920s. You know, when Roosevelt, during the 1920s, had after he had polio, he spent his time developing warm springs and doing various odd jobs. And he was out of public life, and writing was a way for him to occupy himself and keep his name in the public domain. So he actually did a fair amount of writing during the 1920s. And I found in his articles, there was an article from Asia magazine called Shall We Trust Japan? from 1923, where Roosevelt was calling for more engagement with Japan. He thought the Japanese could be trusted to protect peace in the world. But he said that the problem uh, in US-Japanese relations was the Japanese immigrants. They were unassimilable. They couldn't uh, act like whites. They were causing trouble. So Roosevelt said that the exclusion of Japanese immigrants and the laws against them in Western states that prevented them from becoming citizens or from owning property were all good things because they protected the racial purity of white Americans against intermarriage. And I was so amazed to read that from Roosevelt, my great hero, a man that I thought was dedicated to the fight against racism, that I thought, well, if that's what he thought in the 1920s, what did he think in the 1940s? And as I tried to answer that question, I discovered that nobody who had written about Japanese Americans had really written about Roosevelt, and the people who had written about Roosevelt hadn't really written about Japanese Americans. And so there was a hole in the literature. And in the process of doing research to fill that hole and discover what Franklin Roosevelt's connection with the Japanese Americans was, I discovered just how much Japanese Americans have influenced America's life, its law, its culture. And so what started out as a paper became a whole career and a whole uh, life project. Do, did you find or, or do you think, and uh, I'm, I'm reminded of um, a Milton Eisenhower quote that you've, you've um, said before about various reasons why incarceration occurred. 
and how it was a- allowed to occur. D- do you find that um, his um, uh, that the racism that's clearly uh, um, evident in those remarks? was uh, widespread among those of his class um, uh, across the nation, even in areas where people didn't interact with Japanese Americans or, or Japanese immigrants, and that it, it is um, a strain throughout his administration as the 30s progressed and they were looking both to the Far East as well as Europe and the spread of fascism? I think that anti-Japanese racism was very widespread in the 1920s, particularly. Uh, it it. I should have known that Roosevelt would not be any different than other people, that in fact, uh, Roosevelt's friend and neighbor, Cornelius Vanderbilt Jr., did a book about opinions on the Japanese question right at the time that Roosevelt was writing, uh, uh, Shall We Trust Japan? And he found that among the educated Americans and the celebrities he spoke to, from Edna Ferber to Irvin S. Cobb to all the others, they all favored uh, the end of Japanese immigration and restrictions on Japanese residents in the United States. So I think that there was this widespread idea that Japanese were different. It's not that they were necessarily evil, but they couldn't come over to the United States and in one or two or four or 10 generations become Americans because they were just racially different and they would cause trouble. Whether how much that influenced the New Deal, influenced the Roosevelt administration in the 30s is arguable. I think it was a very small matter for Roosevelt before the war. And even we might say after Pearl Harbor, he didn't take any immediate action uh, towards Americans of Japanese ancestry. He signed a proclamation saying that Japanese like Germans and Italian citizens were alien enemies and so restricted on that basis. And there were arrests of individual enemy aliens who were eventually some of them interned. But Roosevelt, I think, would have been perfectly content to leave the Japanese Americans alone if there hadn't been a hue and a cry on the West Coast mm-hmm. for, their, for action against them. And uh, the um, the West Coast, which is hard to remember now at this point, was uh, um, also uh, its elected representatives, largely uh, Republican, especially in California. And were what was the... How much did just base politics play uh, into the equation? Because Roosevelt was a savvy politician, and uh, he also appreciated that he had to to satisfy public opinion. Uh, Was he being led by public opinion, or did this uh, uh, influence public opinion towards uh, an incarceration approach? I think that public opinion definitely played a crucial role uh, in Roosevelt's decision to sign Executive Order 9066 and let the army handle Japanese Americans. There was a a near consensus among the congressional representatives of the West Coast that Japanese Americans had to be dealt with. And uh, there were people who were threatening to take the matter public or to find ways to, to put pressure on the president. And certainly the case of Canada, uh, we, where West Coast public opinion pushed the Canadian government to remove Japanese Canadians from the coast, in spite of the fact that the Army and the Navy in Canada said that it was not necessary, it tends to indicate that there's other forces other than military necessity that come into play. That said, in the United States, the fact that the West Coast defense commanders, notably General John DeWitt, uh, were calling for mass removal of Japanese Americans Uh, and that DeWitt persuaded the War Department that mass removal was necessary was also a very important aspect of life in uh, for the Japanese Americans and a cause of their mass removal. And your your research has also shown though that there were they were thinking about the potential for incarceration uh, long before the war in the 30s uh, in the development of what was then uh, commonly termed uh, as concentration camps and so uh, was that geared more from a, the notion of so-called fifth columnists and uh, potential threats, or was that viewed in the mid, mid to late 30s as more broadly against the entire community? Well, I think that uh, during the 1930s, there is a steady drumbeat of action against Japanese Americans. There's spies who go off and watch over Japanese American communities. In Hawaii, uh, Roosevelt gets a memo that 
uh, Japanese sailors on Japanese ships have been mixing with the community. And Roosevelt says that any uh, Japanese person who mixes with these sailors should have their name put on a list to be put in a concentration camp in case of trouble. And the government built what it called concentration camps in Missoula, Montana, and Bismarck, North Dakota, to take care of enemy aliens. And the Attorney General Francis Biddle even said that they're ready to round up Japanese aliens in case of trouble, in case there's a break of diplomatic relations between Japan and the United States. All that said, on the one hand, I don't think there was a plan for mass action against every single person of Japanese ancestry before Pearl Harbor. I think that they were planning for action against enemy aliens and people who they thought would be dangerous, but they weren't going to uh, erase the Japanese population of the West Coast. That said, the fact that there was all that action and also a drumbeat of uh, propaganda, uh, congressmen uh, made accusations that Japanese American fishing boats in Los Angeles were actually cruisers for the Japanese Navy that could be taken out and refitted at a moment's notice. Uh, or Amy Semple McPherson, the, the uh, evangelist, spread rumors that Japanese American farmers were poisoning their vegetables in case of war. So the fact that there was all this propaganda, what we would call today fake news, helped push public opinion toward an idea that mass action against Japanese Americans was not outlandish, that it was even reasonable or understandable. And of course, we can't help but then think about and compare uh, the treatment of German Americans or Italian Americans uh, at the commencement of the war as well, and the, the very different ways and uh, that they were treated, you know, of course, um, also some were interned, uh, um, but it, the, the, it doesn't compare. The comparison doesn't make a comparison because it shows that, um, that race certainly had a major role in, in this, as well as the fact that the Japanese had attacked U.S. soil. Uh, do, do, in your research, did you find that there was a tension between those differences or was it uh, most likely just driven by, well, the, the political realities uh, also of German Americans in the East Coast and throughout the Midwest so greatly um, were interwoven into the fabric, whereas you could sort of separate Japanese Americans, as you said, because they couldn't be assimilated. Right. Well, Japanese Americans on the West Coast were about 1% of the population. Mm -hmm. So you can say that there was no mass removal of Japanese Americans in Hawaii, which actually had been attacked. Mm -hmm. You know, Pearl Harbor, of course, is in Honolulu, but where Japanese Americans made up almost 40% of the population and the largest part of the workforce and were much more, rather more integrated into the society. Similarly, Japanese Americans on the East Coast were not rounded up en masse, where they were just a, a fraction, a tiny fraction of the population. So in one sense, the Japanese Americans on the West Coast suffered uh, from being enough of a population to be a threat to somebody, but not enough of a population to be able to stand up for themselves or to attract allies. Uh, but I think that there is definitely a racial factor that separates the treatment of Japanese Americans in general from the treatment of German Americans and Italian Americans. Again, individual German aliens mm -hmm. were, were arrested and some of them were interned. But these were people against whom there was individualized suspicion and people who were not U.S. citizens. The large majority of Japanese Americans who were rounded up were U.S. born citizens of an average age of 18, which means that half of the Japanese Americans who were put into camp on this suspicion were kids. Uh, uh, in, in your research as well, in, in thinking about your second uh, uh, book, uh, A Tragedy of D uh, Democracy, in which you expanded your view into Canada and, and Mexico, um, you, you speak a lot uh, about Mackenzie King and the politics there of, of West Coast, of Canadian West Coast um, and public opinion. And President Roosevelt and, you know, Mackenzie King had a close relationship. I know King wanted to be uh, aligned uh, with FDR. Um, did you, is there any discussion between them about these policies or were they so separately handled because of the, of their national situations? I have found no correspondence, let alone coordination mm -hmm. between the U.S. government and the Canadian government 
in terms of the treatment of uh, people of ethnic Japanese uh, race, uh, except that there's one time when the Japanese, uh, the Canadian government is thinking of putting Japanese Canadians at one place in British Columbia, and the Americans say, "Oh, well, that's a railroad depot. That might be that might not be a, the best place." But the the events were so separate mm -hmm. that it's hard to believe that there was any meeting of the minds. Mm -hmm. And of course, this points to a classic Canadian thing. The Canadian government justified its roundup of Japanese Canadians in part by the need to coordinate its policies with those policies of the United States. Uh, and in fact, while the Canadian government acted first, uh, in mid-January, they issued an order forcing all adult males of Japanese ancestry to move away from the coast and actually to go to uh, forced labor and road labor camps. But then uh, the vast, the majority of Japanese Canadians were moved out by order 1486 a few days after executive order 9066 was signed. And the Canadian government said, oh, well, we have to do like the Americans. But then when the Americans started opening up the camps and letting Japanese Americans back to the West Coast in 1945, suddenly the Canadian government didn't feel like it was necessary to coordinate with the Americans anymore. And in fact, Canada's government maintained its restrictions on Japanese Canadians, uh, and they weren't allowed back to the West Coast until April of 1949, fully four years after the war. Are, are those decisions in part being driven by economics and by a sort of a nativist tendency uh, to, uh, to eliminate competition and to take advantage of, of, of uh, current events for, for, for business or personal gain? What certainly characterizes the Canadian experience uh, as different than the United States is that the Canadian government actually confiscated the belongings and the property of Japanese Canadians and sold them off to make people pay for their own internment. Uh, they did not provide funds for confinement and for maintaining of people in the camps. And that was partly on economic grounds and partly to keep Japanese Canadians from ever going back to the West Coast, because if their belongings were sold off and they had nothing to go back for, it was a, a boon for white GIs and others, other favored people who would be able to take over that property cheaply. So I think that uh, this mix of economic greed nativism, uh, war hysteria, and plain old racism does fuel the case both in Canada and the United States, but it, it plays out differently. I think it's also uh, a tribute to the American legal system, to the Bill of Rights, that the American government could only go so far, even an emergency, in violating the rights of Japanese Americans. You referenced and um, mentioned the, 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 the uh, the reality that people's property was taken and uh, sold to support their own incarceration. And it, it, it just brings right to the forefront what we can't ever forget, which are the individuals and the people who are actually having to live this experience and, and, and suffer through it. it we, we talk about and we study frequently uh, from the executive and leadership levels uh, 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 of decision-making, of course, but um, how did those personal stories uh, weave into your thinking? How did that influence uh, how you looked at or formulated your, your um, arguments and your narrative? That's a great question. On the one hand, you know, it is a study of leadership. It is a study of democracy, uh, you know, compared to slavery or mass uh, removal and uh, of, of Native Americans or the Holocaust, the Japanese American uh, confinement is not an atrocity in the same league. And so on the one hand, the transcendent point is about democracy, but that said, you're absolutely right. We cannot forget the individuals and their suffering, the people whose lives were uh, harmed or in some cases broken by this policy and by how it was carried out. I had the for good fortune of meeting a great many Japanese Americans. In one sense, I was lucky because I was just in time to meet these indestructible Nisei who were in their 70s or 80s or even 90s, uh, but who still had stories to tell and powerful ways to communicate uh, 
their experience. And so I was able to see things through their eyes in a way that I would not have been just by looking at documents or considering the, the legality of Japanese American incarceration. I think that the anger that I felt or the sense of betrayal uh, over the government's treatment of Japanese Americans is a product of my talking to people about how a very small thing to bureaucrats can be a very meaningful and decisive thing in people's lives. You know, I uh, did a book on the writer John Okada, uh, co-edited with Frank Abe and Floyd Chung. And John Okada wrote a novel called Nono Boy. And Nono Boy deals with somebody who has refused to uh, obey the call for the draft because his parents are still in camp. And the thing is that his father, the character's father is somebody who's taken away and they don't have any news of him. And then uh, they, they can barely recognize him when he comes back. And so these kind of individual stories of families being destroyed were very powerful to me. And that, that um, then c c connects us um, to the question of Eleanor Roosevelt's uh, her views and role and the way she interacted with people often on a very personal level and the way she used those personal connections to make broader points or to evidence support where it might not otherwise be evidenced uh, more officially or even politically. Um, did, did, did What did you discover? Or how did you see her role either evolve or um, or work in contrast with the president's, with her husband's and the president's, which was always that delicate balance they were striking as a couple. That's one of the most fascinating aspects of the connection between FDR and Japanese Americans is the fight, the, the struggle between FDR and Eleanor. Uh, I've sometimes referred to her as being a kind of a secret dissident within the White House, a loyal opposition that she could only go so far because of her loyalty to FDR, at least in public. But she found all these different ways to help Japanese Americans to make clear her sympathy. She allowed emergency funds from her account with the American Friends Service Committee uh, for Japanese Americans at the time of removal. She asked the military if she could visit one of the assembly centers in 1942, and they told her that it would not be safe. But then in 1943, she actually visited the Gila River camp and gave a speech uh, to the inmates, and then afterwards went to Los Angeles and sort of in the face of West Coast public opinion said, the sooner we get these people out of the camps, the better. Uh, and she defended the War Relocation Authority and against charges that they were coddling Japanese Americans. She said, you know, they certainly don't have uh, fresh food, they don't have uh, fresh meat, and I wouldn't want to live that way. And she worked with uh, the American Friends Service Committee and the NAACP, and she wrote an article in Collier's. And so I, although Eleanor Roosevelt also was limited in her vision, she thought that the cause of Japanese American confinement was the ghettoization of Japanese Americans before the war. And that she said, you know, your problem is that you've congregated amongst your own, and so you need to get out. And so uh, various people thought that she was blaming them for their own predicament. Whereas, in fact, of course, the reason that they were concentrated in Japanese neighborhoods was because they weren't allowed to live anywhere else. Yes. Uh, do you see uh, parallels with um, uh, with the way Black Americans or other people of color were treated during the era it, 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 who were also citizens of this country, who were also being called upon and who also um, fought? Um, for the very nation that was, in fact, denying them uh, their, their very fundamental rights and human dignity. It, was there ever a, a, an attempt or a synthesis between communities to, um, to uh, amplify their um, message? African Americans were definitely disproportionate among critics of Executive Order 9066 and defenders of Japanese Americans. One of the chapters of AFTERCAMP uh, 
uh, that I write is about Hugh Macbeth, uh, an African-American lawyer in Los Angeles who actually went to Washington to try to talk to FDR, to talk him out of mass removal of Japanese Americans and to sign an executive order against racism. And uh, Hugh Macbeth gave information to Norman Thomas, the head of the Socialist Party, who became the only national political figure to oppose Executive Order 9066. And Hugh Macbeth also joined with the Japanese American Citizens League to try and bring legal actions against Executive Order 9066. And there are others. Langston Hughes, the poet, uh, wrote columns for the Chicago Defender against Executive Order 9066. And Lael Lane, a school teacher in New York, denounced uh, the confinement of Japanese Americans and Erna B. Harris, a columnist in Los Angeles. And But what's interesting is when you talk about synthesis, the activist Pauli Murray, having been in, misinformed that Japanese Americans had been sent outside of the West Coast for their own safety, actually wrote to FDR to say, if you can move Japanese Americans for their own safety, how come you can't move Negroes from the South? And Eleanor Roosevelt saw that letter and she wrote a blistering reply to Pauli Murray. She said, I wonder how many of our Negro citizens would like to be treated as if they were not uh, properly as properly here uh, by right as everybody else. I'm deeply concerned that we've had to do this to the Japanese Americans, but at least, you know, we're at war with Japan and they haven't been here for so long. It would be a real problem if we did this to people who have been here as long as most of the whites. Well, her, her uh, understanding of Japanese American citizenship was a little uh, shaky, but the point is that she was right on target in terms of understanding that while there certainly was discrimination against Japanese Americans as against African Americans, the government's own policy was not one that was protecting their civil rights. As uh, as we as I think about um, concluding today, um, I guess this uh, our, your most recent. Um, statements, would you approach these topics? Would you approach this differently today if you were starting? Of course, I know that's a very broad question. Of course, 20 years on in our lives and careers, we would approach things differently. But in terms of uh, perhaps framing a question or in terms of what you've already written, and when you look back on it, um, of how you might, should you ever want or have opportunity to revise or addend because, you know, you're, you write, you know, you never stop writing, do you? Uh, um, uh, I think uh, it's an interesting question to me to hear from a, a scholar how their views and how the national picture, for that matter, how uh, our the environment within which we work has changed in 20 years. How has your approach to this or your thinking to this, has it evolved and changed too? Well, certainly, uh, while I stand behind what I wrote in By Order of the President, I would write it somewhat differently today. Uh, first of all, I had no idea about the connection between or the, the counterpoint between Japanese American removal and Japanese Canadian removal mm -hmm. in, the, in the way that I did later. And again, I didn't know about the pre-war actions of the government. Uh, I also would be stronger on the international nature. For example, I don't have in my in my books a description of the negotiations between the United States and the government of Panama uh, during 1941. And so as the bombs were falling on Pearl Harbor, uh, joint teams came from the United States, which controlled the Panama Canal Zone and the Republic of Panama to arrest all people of Japanese ancestry within Panama and bring them into the Panama Canal Zone to be interned, and they were subsequently brought to the U.S. mainland. So that's a part of internment, if you want, that is really absent from my work and that I didn't know about at the time. And I think that there have been much more in the way of discussion of resistance in the camps that uh, has been since I wrote by order of the president. I think that I would be more aware of, for example, some of the arbitrariness of the treatment of Japanese Americans in the confinement center at Tule Lake, the, the place where those who were deemed to be disloyal were sent, uh, were segregated out and sent and barred from uh, resettlement outside of the camps. Those choices were made on the basis of a very random set of uh, questions on a questionnaire and people who should not have had, who should not have been there, who were indeed 
loyal Americans should not have been sent. Well, you know, your answer just uh, highlights that the scholarship always continues and that um, uh, that there's always more to learn and more to research and more to um, explore. And that is a good a good thing. I really appreciate the willingness of the FDR library to explore the totality of FDR's administration and his legacy. Even for me, even though I'm critical of FDR on his treatment of Japanese Americans, he's still my hero. He's still a great president. And I think that we can only gain from understanding the richness and complexity of the history of his contributions. Well, thank you. And thank you again for um, joining us. And uh, I, in conclusion, I would just like to once again, thank uh, Patty Hirahara. Um, her, her, she has a this is a personal part of her history. Her her father and her family were were interned, incarcerated, and so without her support and her encouragement, um, uh, this program wouldn't have, um, in many ways, as much value. And so we really appreciate what she's done um, to um, help us host these types of programs. So once again, thank you for joining us today and um, and uh, follow us uh, on social media and on our website at www.fdrlibrary.org. Thank you.